So welcome back to the AEC Hive podcast. I'm Ralph Montague, director at ArcDocs, one of the co-founders of AEC Hive, where we're discussing innovation in architecture, engineering, and construction. And I'm joined today by my co-founder, John Egan from BIM Launcher. John, do you want to say a quick hi to everybody? Hi, everyone. This is John from BIM Launcher. Looking forward to today's podcast. Right, and so we're, we're really happy today to be joined by Ravi Wood, who's the BIM manager at Gresham Smith Architects and or a multidisciplinary firm of uh, practice in Nashville, Tennessee. Ravi, you're very welcome. Uh, do you want to just introduce yourself and give us a little bit of background to uh, what you're doing? Thank you, Rolf. First of all, I'm truly grateful to you and John for taking our time. You know, we are in challenging times and I'm really grateful for you guys to take our time and us to talk about innovation at this critical juncture. I'm looking forward to it. And a little bit about myself as I am trained as an architect. I did my undergrad and I'm from India. I'm also a licensed architect in India. I did my master's in planning. I got a scholarship, so I came to study in the States. I've been here for the last 15 years or so. And in the meantime, I've worked in almost all across the world and with some great people. And I've always admired the work you have done, Rolf uh, and uh, John. So I thought I'll reach out to you guys and thank you for having me on the show. That's great. Uh, yeah, you're very welcome. We, John and I have basically set up AEC Hive to try and create some discussion and community around innovation in the AEC sector because uh, I suppose we, we see great innovations happening in pockets around the world, but you know, we're just trying to connect people. So it's great to be connected with you. And uh, obviously in your role for working for a multidisciplinary practice on large-scale projects like hospitals and aviation, etc., do you see a lot of innovation and within your own company and also within within the teams that you collaborate with? Yes, actually, as we were discussing before, you know, I believe uh, how the Apple iPhone evolved, you know, t- 10 years ago, and it really kind of, you know, broke all the ceilings. Now our phones are so powerful. It's more powerful than the computers that used to be. So I see a similar transition construction industry will go through in the next 10 10 to 15 years. Uh, I truly believe that. The major innovations that I feel, you know, earlier we were all thinking local. I think now we are stranded locally, but we are all thinking global because, you know, it's one small community. It's all across the world. We are all at home. Innovation is going to be all across the globe. There will be a need for spaces to be designed which are multifunctional. So a arena can transform into a hospital or at the same time could become a school. And I think we'll have more multifunction spaces coming up in the future as well. Yeah, I think this current crisis is really just highlighted how we need to be connected across the Internet and uh, and. It's also demonstrated, I think, for a lot of people that we maybe we don't need to be co-located and sitting next to each other all the time to to uh, yes. achieve great things. True, and one of the things I feel that humanity is very resilient in by nature. So you know, we will come back, and when we do, this whole crisis will seem like an opportunity. Just imagine within the last two months, all the firms that have gone technologically advanced. I think we all took a giant step, at least, you know, which could have taken four or five years within a month that everyone can work from home, pretty much. Um, construction sites can be surveilled from a remote location. So there is a lot of positive as well coming out of this. And I think, you know, sort of modern methods of construction and, you know, a lot, of, a lot more off-site manufacturing, you know, I think People are, it's going to open people's minds to a lot of more interesting and more productive ways of um, of working and collaborating out of necessity almost. True, true, Rolf. I think you'd... No, sorry, Ravi. I was just going to ask. I, I think that it's a really interesting point that you put forward about almost, you know, the coronavirus has almost forced innovation in the 
construction industry what would have taken five years down into a month. And I'm wondering really from your perspective and your working day, how, how has your working day changed? How have you had to adapt and what part of your role, the part you play in projects has been, I suppose, accelerated from five years to a month? And if you could give us any examples of that. Sure, John. A couple of things. We are a pioneer company in the AC industry in America. The way we were agile the way we transformed within almost 24 hours to try, everybody moved to a setup of work from home, our servers, our infrastructure, our training that we have had for years with the people helped us to be pretty much be available, um, you know, from home very next day. And none of our projects were uh, disrupted. We actually were able to transform our clients and everyone were happy to see nothing change. So that's a good thing. I think in general, in terms of the AC industry, uh, I believe uh, we are making uh, a a leap here, as I said before. At the same time, we are going to, as Ralph mentioned before, he hit the nail on the head that we are going to use this to become more productive, more efficient, more profitable. The way it's going to happen is the AC technology is going to be used to give us more iterations. If we see generative design, it's going to be more focused with a laser sharp focus on creating spaces for the future. So I think there's a lot of good that has came out and I think the future is going to be bright for everyone. I think one of the biggest changes is is working on the cloud, you know, because when you're all sitting in an office and you've got a desktop machine with, with all the applications, communicating with a, a, an internal file server, you know, that's, that's one arrangement, but suddenly everybody's been moved away from that environment and, you know, now they have to exchange information over the internet. So that's been a, a big change. And I think the companies with, that who were already doing that obviously could transform very quickly, but companies that, that weren't working in that way have been severely impacted. True. But at the same time, the good thing is, yes, we are working on the cloud, but at the same time, it doesn't feel very different. Everyone can stay connected, you know, at the touch of a button. So I think things in terms of uh, innovation going to happen in the future as well. And the analogy I'm thinking of is, you know, like your telephone used to be connected to the wall by cable. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, it, you know, and then we got mobiles and that just opened up a whole opportunity of where you could walk around with your telephone and, uh, and you no, no longer had to sit in the hallway of your house. So in fact, connected, connected to the wall. <laughs> exactly. And, and uh, that's just, happening for AC, you know. Yeah. In fact, today is the NFL draft that's going to happen for the American football. And this is the first time they're doing it. Everything and you know, everybody's in their home and doing it. In fact, they needed to have landlines for each of the managers to call in. And apparently some of them didn't have landlines. So that's how, you know, we have grown there. Nobody has landlines in their homes anymore. In terms of innovation and what innovations you see as being necessary and what innovations you see coming, like what in the way you're working as a business and in your own job frustrates you at the moment about the AEC sector and, and you know, what what innovations would you like to see happening? And, and then also maybe speak a little bit about what innovations uh, you are participating in at the moment. So I think more than frustrations, the opportunities, I believe, for the future are for the AC construction, the technology side of things is that, one, we do not have a unified format across the globe where we agree to things. We can agree to disagree, but, you know, if we can have a global uh, consensus on how and what we define as uh, a level of detail, for example, or how uniform technology can be throughout the world, interoperability would be a factor in that. I think these are the things that I feel are a big challenge. But there is, of course, you know, things like generative design and automation, which are going to go leaps and bounds after this because clients are going to ask for more value for their money. And if we can give automation for a task that was being done by 10 people and gets done by a script in no time, I think that will be the big things that will come out of this. So both of those factors I am involved in, 
globally in most of the BIM community. I'm, I go across as a guest speaker uh, from every AU pretty much. In fact, the good thing is in the latest Autodesk University, I was voted as the best speaker for BIM. The class is highly recommended for anybody who wants to learn BIM management. Second, I've spoken across Hong Kong, Sweden, Canada, pretty much everywhere. I'm involved with the communities and getting to that to that point where we can all have a consensus. That's one. The second, things like generative design. I work with AC companies like Autodesk and their Revit 2020 or 21, but I'm involved with developers for the future. So we work together to kind of create solutions for the coming years. In Europe, obviously, the ISO standard came out in 2018, ISO 19650 which kind of sets out a, a methodology for for uh, organizing and, and digitizing the construction industry. And that was adopted by the European Standards Committees and which made it mandatory for all of the European states to adopt that standard. Uh, and if they had any competing national standard to drop that standard. So what we have now in Europe is a, a common standard adopted it's an international standard, but it's adopted at European level for all European countries. What's happening in the United States? I mean, you obviously have different federal states, and is that international or ISO standard being recognized as something that should be adopted, or is, are people still doing their own thing? I think most of the time the people are doing their own thing, but it's regulated by AIA. I think AIA is, is the premier um, or body that is driving the BIM right now. But there is a need for a UK level two BIM is pretty good. That's what I thought. That's what I feel. So I think, uh, and ISO standards as well. So I think those on a broader sense can serve across the world as well. You have the AIA and obviously you also have the NBIMS standard. I mean, is there any discussion, I suppose, in the United States where those bodies are beginning to review or recognize the ISO standard or are they participating in the adoption of those or? Yes, a few of them are, but as I said, it's still up in the air and that's the opportunity or the challenge for all of us for the future. I think you made the comment, John, on one of the previous calls, you know, like developing apps on platforms, you know, that, that having a common standard Absolutely. provides Absolutely. developers yeah. and people an opportunity to to work to something that's common. Absolutely, yeah. That I think that was that was the culmination of one of our previous calls, where it was and and we actually brought the technology analogy, whereby you have iOS and you have Android, and the ISO 19650 is, I would say that it is an early stage iOS app store. So it's an API, it's a rule book, firstly, on how projects can be governed and information can be managed throughout the life cycle of a project. And, you know, with that, you could create various different interfaces into that workflow and what's out- outlined in ISO 19650 as the data management Speaking as a as a software developer and, and the CEO of a software development company, it gives us great confidence that we can build on top of a standard because that standard commoditizes the information management. And when something becomes a commodity, you know, you can you can build your platform on top of that and your applications and you can hook straight into that. So if we look at the adoption in Europe, for example, we know that ISO 19650 is used by all the leading governments and Ralph, you pointed out that it was so it was it's the culmination of 10 years worth of work, starting with the S1192 standards and having since since evolved into the ISO 19650. To, to my mind, I think it's and I've spoken to um, some US based um, um, contacts of mine and. You know, when I've put across this argument that, hey, look, you should really be taking this ISO 19650 seriously, because what's actually happening to my mind is that U.S. is making the same mistakes that we did 15 years ago. And that is that they're doing everything bespoke, same, different, different um, implementation every time. And if we come back to the analogy of the App Store, this is the equivalent of building your firmware on top of your hardware. 
the operating system on top of the firmware, your your base software on top of the operating system, and then also implementing your own API and and trying to build innovation on top of that. It's just a moving target that you you can't create the consistency and the reliability that you need in order to innovate, to my mind. And yeah, I think that until the US catches up and and actually starts to take these information management standards, it's, I mean, Europe is just going to waltz ahead in terms of um, our our productivity and and all that other good stuff that comes with good information management. Ravi, like if you just take your own company as an example, what do you think is the challenge to picking up these international standards and, and using them? Is it that companies have such a, a deep legacy of or a way of doing things that, that might um, be different to that standard and it's difficult to, to switch? Or is your own company sort of practicing on top of these ISO standards? I mean, we as a company are doing very well, but I'm more focused of when I referenced about, it was more of a general understanding of the practice and culture across across the globe. And it's not specific to any company uh, across the globe. You know, yes, UK has a different uh, set of standards and ISO is being adopted across the European countries. But what about, um, you know, Middle East or what about in Singapore and Asia and Russia and America? You know, everywhere it's a different sta- set of standards. So eventually, I think could well, I, I, I saw is an international standard. standard yeah, but uh, uh, it's committee. the adoption yeah. adoption of yeah, the standard. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can make a standard, but how well it is adopted is a very localized thing. And that's why, you know, going back to what I said before, now, earlier, everyone was so distant in their mind that, you know, Oh, you know, it's a different country, it's a different place. But now we are all facing the same thing. Pretty much everyone is at home. So, you know, we are all, I think, in the same boat now. And I think a more global feel will come in and people will start to realize that it's important to have a global standard across so that it'll give clients a better understanding of what the end results could look like. And the processes will become more standardized. Deviations will get more pronounced. And when deviations are pronounced, then people will be able to make earlier call and judgments of, you know, be it estimation or anything else, more sound and better judgment on what the future could look like. I mean, I suppose a lot of people don't sort of connect standards and innovation. But, you know, like going back to your analogy, John, you know, if you just look at the web, you know, it's, it's only because of robust HTML standards that the web has been able to flourish and people have been able to do amazing, you know, websites and web apps and all sorts of things, you know, because there's a robust set of standards. And I don't know if you just project yourself 15 years ago, like, you know, certain websites wouldn't open in certain browsers and, you know, it was quite awkward. But as that those standards became refined and, and used, that allowed for massive innovation. You know, what do you think, Ravi? Like, do you see the connection between standards and innovation? Yes, and you know, you gave a great uh, John gave a great analogy, and you are right. You know, it, it's basically we are all moving forward, but are we in the right direction and in the same direction? And are we together? I think standards help us get there, and it's it's one way to just do it the Nike way, but it's one thing to do it the right way. And when we do things the right way, we all have seen that it's good, it gives good results to everyone. Like my own feeling is that most people see standards as something restrictive and awkward. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, yep, yep. yeah. And and they don't see it as something that's liberating and, uh, you know, which is an incorrect sort of view of standards. It's, um, it's, it's actually the opposite, like standards – are liberating. They they yep. they free you up. You know, free your time up. They it allows you to follow the rule book the same way on every project. You know, it True. makes it easy and makes communications easy. But I think when you talk to people about standards, you know, the eyes glaze over. And, you know, like they see it as something. That, oh, this is going to make my life terrible, and you know, it's going to be awkward to use. And uh. <laughs> True. And you know, two things you mentioned which I really liked was one is. People perceive it as a hindrance, but it's big support. Uh, in classic example of it, 
let's say, you know, I've seen so many people try to automate something and they'll spend days, hours, weeks at time to get to a point which could be done in a few minutes manually. There, And that's what is like a complete waste of time. So going back, you know, standards also, the basic idea of standards is that there is a level of understanding and we all can learn from each other in that. That's the key thing, because if you're not learning from each other, we might just be reinventing the wheel that somebody else has already done and spending the time of companies. So to avoid that, standards are important. You are absolutely right. It's not a hindrance. It's actually an enabler. Of innovations within your region or your area, like what's happening in Nashville? Are there sort of active user groups or active hackathons and or just groups that are coming together and talking about innovation in AEC and maybe exploring things? Yes, true. There are uh, hackathons happening, not just in Nashville, but across uh, the states and Canada that I'm at least aware of and part of. Uh, but uh, not just hackathons, there's a lot of, in, you know, conferences where we get together, learn from each other. The biggest teacher actually is a project, you know. So when we see things being done um, by someone and we think that can really be replicated and can help us, then we do uh, in the beat of a second. And I think the same is for everyone. Uh, I think we are going to move slowly into a zone where only the the best will survive. So it's very important to be ahead of the curve in terms of innovation and technology, because unless you are there, uh, it's going to be hard to survive. Yeah. I think the, like in general, <clears throat> sort of um, research and development within the AEC sector, you know, formal research and development is, is quite low. Although, as you say, w- within projects, there's obviously lots of innovation uh, always happening and, you know, projects always involve exploring new materials, new methodologies, new processes, etc. Mm-hmm. But often that innovation stays within that project and never gets distributed, you know, sure. even within firms. I used to work for a very big firm uh, of architects and, you know, they're just structured into teams and you'd never hear about what the other teams were doing or, you know, what they discovered or what they explored. <laughs> Yes. And, uh, so, so, the, so the innovation is short-lived. It's not formal, and it's it's kind of locked in a project. Um, you know, it's almost siloed. You know, amongst the the various disciplines that participate in the the project. So it's not that innovation isn't happening. It's just not happening in a in a way that can be distributed uh, across the sector. True. Um, do, do do what do you do in your own? Business, you're obviously a big multidisciplinary practice uh, to ensure that that innovations are not sort of uh, forgotten or locked into projects and not distributed. True. I think again, you hit the important key point that you know innovation shouldn't be in silos, and also it should percolate to be, to everyone. That's the key thing. It's one thing to invent the best, you know, car, self-driving car, but Unless others can use it, it doesn't make sense. It has to have a mass appeal. And that's when the dividends pay off. Uh, At the same time, you know, I think uh, innovation typically, as you said, uh, uh, it cannot just be limited to projects. And, you know, there there is a definite void in the AC industry right now where people can innovate on the, and there are a few firms that are doing very well, like yours, ArcDocs and a few others, but um, I think there is definitely a void where uh, innovation in term could, it could be apps, it could be uh, working with the industry in general to create standards. Uh, it could be creating new add-ins, uh, more automation. I think there is definitely a need for that uh, in the industry. That's my personal opinion, though. Mm, absolutely, and we'd agree. I mean, one of the reasons we, we set up AEC Hive 
was to try and create some sort of community of sharing, you know, where so people can share what they're doing and, uh, you know, some of that innovation can be more distributed and, and also tested because if you, if you're inventing something in a silo, then you, as you say, you're not getting the mass, uh, appeal or mass, uh, the masses giving you commentary on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> true, um, true. And, yeah, yeah. and I think that's where your firm does very well. You know, you uh, identify a challenge, but at the same time, you're constantly talking to the industry uh, because I think the most important thing one can do is to listen, listen to the client. And I think that's being done very well with, with our talks and your company and BIM launcher as well, John. It's interesting. I, I mean, I'm just still dwelling on the standards conversation that we had. And, you know, I think like Ravi points out, the standards are quite challenging to implement and therefore challenge overall adoption. And I'm wondering if Ravi, I suppose, from your experience of working on projects, is there anything that you think other than creating forums to share lessons learned so that knowledge is not lost from implementing the standards. Is there anything that you could share with the community or maybe some younger listeners that are just getting into the BIM world and how they can, I suppose, engage with standards and if they're starting to implement standards, is there any advice that you could give them? Well, more than advice. We, I'm also a student of AC, you know, industry architecture yeah. in general. I think I'm a lifelong student. So I think keeping to that spirit to learn uh, and being humble, making sure we count our blessings every day. These are the things that I try to follow. And I think everyone can learn from that. Also, in terms of creating an, an environment where we can encourage to have standards, you know, as you said, if we can build up that community where people can come to agree and agree to disagree would be the key factor. And you, Ravi, you um, have interesting experience because you've worked in Singapore, uh, India, America, you know, different markets. What do you think you've learned from those different places? What sort of positive things can we learn from Singapore? What things can we learn from India? What things can we learn from the U.S.? Good and bad, you know, like what, what have you seen that's really pushed innovation in those markets and what has been restricting innovation? I think the things that I uh, am grateful that I had the opportunity to, to work in different markets and different countries is that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the most important are the people, you know, the people that you work with, the people you work for uh, as your clients uh, and the end user. You know, if you're making a housing, uh, we should make sure that the end client and end user is is being served to the best of what we can. So that's the key thing that I learned. The challenge in terms of technology is that it's still in the nascent phase. It's still quite young. Uh, and there are forums, but it's very spor- sporadic. You know, as we said before, there is a need for standards. There's no point, you know, 100 people moving in 100 different directions. Yes, it allows us to think outside the box, but, you know, uh, it also repeats a lot of work being done in the industry. So as long as we can create a watering hole, if I may say, where people can come and uh, collaborate and create a place where people can bounce off ideas and innovation, there can be easy knowledge transfer would be very, very helpful for the industry. What technologies or innovations um, are you currently looking at that are really exciting to you that you see might have a, a real positive impact on the on the AEC sector in the in the near future in the future? Three key things, I think four key things that I were part of my lecture as well. One of them is automation. You know, hands down, that's going to be a key thing coming forward. If we can automate and save time on a task that takes five hours and bring it down to one hour, that saves half a day for someone at the end. And that's going to be a key. How best we can visualize, virtualize, give more and more options with flexible designs, iterations through generative design. That's going to be the second key factor. 
also at the same time a lot of AEC industry is moving towards something we call as big data where we harness recon as much as data as we can be it in the systems of the user be in terms of design parameters be it in terms of construction cost uh, factors everything it will it will be a lot of data that we will be managed in the future so i call it the reconnaissance and actually when i it all boils down the last one is as we said, spoke before it's one thing to create things in silos but having a mass appeal and getting it to the people comes in from a culture innovation is not just path breaking discovery it's innovation is a culture so building that culture is also a key thing and if somebody breaks it down it comes down to r for reconnaissance a for automation v for visualization and i for innovation uh, or you know innovation culture i i brought up with this acronym because it rhymes with my name you know r a v i so Very reconnaissance good. automation visualization and innovation yeah, no, I think a lot of the um, AEC sector at the moment are engaged in sort of tedious and mundane tasks, producing drawings and drawing bathroom layouts and door schedules, and <laughs> you know, o- over and over again. And you wonder how many times do you have to well, how many times do you have to draw a, a bathroom layout? <laughs> well, and um, yeah, I think the automation part that you mentioned there is people are going to be beginning to realize like we don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to engage in these tedious tasks because but we can automate some of those. I'll tell you an interesting story. One of the premier architects in India, the premier, there's a story that the first year he came and was working as an intern, uh, he studied abroad, came back, was doing only bathrooms because interns, you know, we get the, the least preferred job. And he did it for a couple of years and suddenly he broke out and he's the biggest architect. There is no harm in doing restrooms, but I think as much as we can automate, I think that will be a good, good thing for the future. I'm sure most people are looking forward to that. And, you know, that, that links back to the the key driver, I think, of digitization, and what, particularly in Europe, is that um, productivity has to be significantly increased in the AEC sector. So we, we, the sector as a whole is struggling to deliver the, the infrastructure that the world needs for housing, for education, healthcare, you know, around the world. And, and it's just not meeting the demands and also the costs of construction are too high. Mm-hmm. The time it takes to deliver projects is too long. The quality is, you know, questionable. And, yeah. uh, and the impact that the, the sector is having on the environment is significant. You know, so there's a lot of sure. big challenges, most of those related to low productivity, low profitability. So, you know, I think the automation thing is going to be a and game changer. Exactly, a game changer. And efficiency and profitability are going to be key drivers for the future. When we say that, you know, I think that this is whole process is of coronavirus is an opportunity for us because if you see none of the drawings are being printed to let go on site it's all pdfs now right mm. so people are saving on those so that's a big thing uh second thing yes you're right time as much as we can finish projects on time there's nothing like it and there is thirdly you know we have some technology but there is uh, there can be more where we we really integrate all the MSP projects and everything to create a niche where we make projects better. Uh, also, keep adding value through, you know, having more and more options, giving better designs in terms of weather resistance or climate and saving energy. And those kind of things will be crucial as well. And bringing the cost down of projects, you know, all of these things will play a part and innovation is very important for all of yes. them. I think one of the things that holds a lot of companies back is this kind of incorrect thinking that build, every building is bespoke, you know, um, yeah. uh, and, and that's not entirely true because if you think of the materials and the components that make up buildings, you know, those aren't bespoke because they have to go through a long development process, certification and testing and whatever to become, you know, available on the market as, as materials and, and components that you can uh, incorporate into buildings. So if you think of buildings as assemblies of standardized components and materials, you can, you can assemble it in a bespoke way, but, but the, 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 
the things that make up the buildings aren't really bespoke you know, and they're reusable. You know, yep. so, so once once you've done that, you know, that door schedule once, <laughs> you know, the, the doors, is, well, particularly with BIM, I mean, the, the doors are reusable because those are, they represent products on the market and they're reusable in multiple projects. So you don't have to, you don't have to draw the door every, for every project from scratch. <laughs> yes. And doors are such a nightmare in Revit. So talking about standards, I think if we can have a standard library of Revit technology tools, I think that will also help. So that way processes are more defined uh, as well. Yeah. And, and it can, I know one size doesn't fit everyone. So it could be like four different, five different levels and a company, companies can choose between which level uh, the project fits into. You know, if it's a Less than 10,000 square feet project, it doesn't make sense to do the same thing we are doing in a million square feet project. My feeling is at the moment, the wrong people are producing the, the information, you know, because you've got architects and engineers drawing doors and windows and toilets and, you know, whatever. The manufacturers of those products should make available the digital version of their product as well. And so what the architects and engineers should really be spending their time doing is creating the bespoke assemblies of products that are available in their region or in their market. And the, the, the actual creation of digital content should be by the, the company that has the best knowledge of that product, which is the, the product manufacturer. You said it right. You know, It's all about being smart, yes, because being smart means why do the things same twice? So mm. if the door manufacturer is the one who's going to do the final detailed drawing, why do... The, uh, the designer have to do it. They can just keep a placeholder in place um, for a level 100 design. So, yes, why duplicate efforts? At the same time, yes, let the best person do the job. Uh, both the things are important. And, again, if we can have a process that's in line for the industry, because it, as of now, if we don't have it, that'll help. John, this is where your passion at the moment is connected common data environment. You'd see a, a, a future where all the manufacturers would have a, a common data environment with their products on, and those would be connected to organizations who need those digital products or their building designs. So, you know, they'll have their own common data environment. Then that will be connected to the project, which will, you know, have its own common data environment. But if they're all connected, it's the same information. In the UK, they talk about the golden thread of information, you know, that it's it's linked between all the participants at those levels, uh, in, in, including, I mean, one yes. of the participants would be the, um, the government and the local authorities and the county councils. Absolutely. Do you see that? Well, I, I mean, you're, you're doing some work on, on a, with a building smart group. Yeah. CD, Open CD, CDs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As Ravi identified that if we standardize and classify objects, that can be used by everyone in BIM models. Um, it it, it um, takes steps towards producing another topic or another solution or requirement that Ravi suggested earlier in the call um, of creating this one language for interoperability and a consensus between multiple parties. And the same can be done for between CDEs. So when moving information containers, whether it be drawings or any other type of document, model, whatever it may be, between systems, once again, we can use classification and leverage classification so that we, we have a common format for multiple CDEs to map to and be able to share between CDEs. And that's, that's ultimately what, about what the open CDE group is working on um, so that's uh, that's as you pointed out a building smart group and we're working on the building smart side we're working on the practical the implementation of this and developing the technologies that would actually enable the sharing of information between CDEs and then importantly on the other side we're also working with the ISO and SEN groups to prescribe the method into, into a standard where everyone can leverage the, uh, the standard for exchange and information. And importantly, what, what this standards group also brings to these technologies that we'd actually build to exchange this information is the governance and the open governance. There's uh, quite, a, quite a few points that I've brought up there that um, could be leveraged, perhaps a framework um, for standardization 
across our world of new new technologies across the industry requiring governance requiring i suppose the technical implementation and of technologies and there's a lot of work to do but we have some great companies involved so we have everyone from like technology providers like graphisoft trimble aconex think projects and then you have smaller specialists like BIM Launcher, who is in the room to advise on how we actually implement these technologies in in practice through our services that we offer to companies to exchange information between CDEs. There's a lot of pieces, and um, I mean, it's exciting and definitely a step in the right direction. There's a group in the U.S., uh, Ravi, uh, is it the Construction Progress Coalition? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Are you engaged with any of those types of groups? Uh, no, but trying to I, push standardized ways of exchanging information. Uh, no, but I'm I, building smarter is is also pretty one of the pioneers in this field, but not with the coalition, no, not yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose we're coming up to the hour, but I mean, is there any final remarks you want to make? Well, I really, as I said before, I wanted to th- thank for John and you, Rolf, for this opportunity. I think. This was a very fruitful discussion, and I think I'll continue to learn from you guys and uh, anything I can assist in the future to you guys, please let me know. Yeah, well, I think we just want to keep connected and part of the community that we, we're just trying to create an open community where people can talk and share and discuss things and just generally progress the sector you know, as we move forward. Uh, any last comments from yourself, John? And the idea of the podcast is to give a platform to our guests. And I wanted to put another question back to Ravi and ask, is there anything that he would like, you know, his listeners to um, to do or any message that he'd like to put, put out to anyone that's listening to this podcast? Going with the times to stay safe, stay healthy and all the best for everyone, you know, best wishes. And I think we'll overcome this very soon and we'll win. Yeah. And where can yeah. people get hold of you if they want to connect? LinkedIn is a great place. I'm pretty active. I think I have around 15,000 uh, followers. So I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Great. Okay. We just, I just want to, from my side, say thank you very much. It's really interesting. Um, I think you've got great experiences and, and in what you've been doing. And we just enjoy being connected to you and continue to have these discussions going forward. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate that as well. And everyone have a great, great week ahead. Thanks, Ravi.